Welcome everybody. It's good to have you with us for this webinar put on by IceWarm, Improving the Reliability of Australia's Hydropower. And we're delighted that Associate Professor Steve Seams is with us from Nonat Monash University. My name is Trevor Pillar. I'm the National Partnerships Manager here at IceWarm, and uh, we are in for an interesting 50 minutes, I reckon. Upcoming webinars, I won't go into the detail there, but you can see three or four free webinars there, and there's a couple of face-to-face, -face, three face-to-face -face, um, courses still coming up uh, later in this year from IceWarm. And the agenda, agenda today, simple, 25 minutes presentation from Steve and 25 minutes Q&A open to everybody, and we want to hear from you as often and as loud as possible. That will be great. Secondly, there's a recording going to be sent back to you after the um, the webinar is completed. Uh, we'll email it out to you. And finally, when the webinar finishes, you'll be presented with a screen asking a few tick type questions. It's a feedback form that will help us shape our future webinars. We'd be delighted if you can fill that out for us. That'd be terrific. Now, right on to today's presenter, Associate Professor Steve Seams from Monash University. Uh, his PhD majored in numerical studies of stratocumulus clouds from the University of Washington. Uh, his background is in meteorology and cloud physics. Uh, there's a lot more in that introduction, but I'd just like to point out um, the second item. Uh, he is now at Monash University. Steve's currently leading a joint project with Snowy Hydro, Hydro Tasmania, and the Vic. Victorian Department of Sustainability and Environment and the Centre for Australian Weather and Climate Research. It's a lot of a lot of people, a lot of uh, interesting research to investigate the formation of precipitation in wintertime storms across Tasmania and the lower Great Dividing Range. I'm not going to read any more of that because there's a ton that Steve has to offer us today and the more time he has to speak, the better. So Steve, it's right over to you. Thank you so much for spending your time today and uh, and, and presenting this, this webinar. With, we're waiting to see what uh, comes, comes from it. Such an interesting topic. Thank okay. you. Over to you. Well, thank you, Trevor. I'm really happy to be here today. Uh, let me just pop up this on full screen. Hopefully, everybody can see this. Um, as Trevor mentioned or introduced me, very nice introduction. Uh, I'm an associate professor here at Monash University. Yes, I, I wanted to first off acknowledge my uh, collaborators, Dr. Yi Huang and Professor Michael Matten here at Monash University. I'm showing some results over the past 10 years. There have been many postgraduate students and a number of researchers that have contributed to it. Today in particular, I'm going to acknowledge a PhD student, uh, Femi Samadhi, who's getting close to finishing up and doing some numerical simulations for us. So earlier this year, at the end of May, we were awarded an ARC linkage grant with Snowy Hydro, Hydro Tasmania, with the Bureau of Meteorology and the University of Wyoming in the United States. And we wanted to look at orographic precipitation over the Great Dividing Range and over Tasmania. And the industry partners for this have been really supportive. We've worked with them for a number of years and obviously they have a vested interest in what's going on. So today I just want to talk a little bit about their motivation. Um, often, you know, they have a very pragmatic, practical industry perspective on this. Um, some of the science, some of the limitations that we have in estimating and measuring and forecasting the precipitation over the mountains. Then I want to go ahead and speak a little bit of the meteorology and speak about orographic precipitation, the dynamics and the microphysics of what's going on. And then I will talk a bit about the research proposal, some of the new observations we hope to implement some of the new satellite observations, and some of the numerical models that we are working with and uh, we hope to improve. So the hydroelectric companies obviously um, trying to generate as much power as efficiently as possible. In the last few months, there's been a lot of talk about pump hydro and the prime minister has supported the Snowy 2.0, so increasing and in enhancing the ability of the snowy hydro scheme to provide peak hour power for us. And part of this comes with, part of this comes from running their system as efficiently as possible. The hydroelectric companies, as you know, operate basically as a battery. During the day, they'll allow the water to flow out, generating energy during peak hours. And then at night, when the demand is low, they'll absorb or take in some of the baseline power to pump the water back up and then be ready for the next day. And part of this though is that their system, either in Tasmania or across the Snowy Mountains, 
is, is a series of different reservoirs and dams and drops and, and it's not just a single one point operation. And so when they make plans for the day and where to run from, they often like to have input on where is it, where, if anywhere, is it going to be precipitating or where they expect runoff from melting snow. They need this information to help them op run their operation as efficiently as possible. In the wintertime, in particular, that's when most of the precipitation comes across the snowy mountains in Tasmania. It's very important to distinguish between snow and rainfall. Rainfall will reach the reservoirs much more quickly, runs off much more efficiently. Snow, when you get snowpack up in the snowy, it can hang around for weeks or months and then slowly trickle into the groundwater before reaching the reservoirs. So for their hydrology model, they need accurate precipitation forecasts. They need to know whether it's snow or whether it's rainfall. And these hydrology models are not only used for their operations, but for downstream operations, especially for the Murray and the Murrumbidgee rivers, modeling the water, the stream flow through these catchments. For snowy hydro, getting the accurate forecasts that are really important for the environmental releases. This is obviously one of their major operating, I don't want to say constraints, but you know, one of their major operational considerations is getting the environmental releases. And on both, we'll also speak briefly, Snowy Hydro and Hydro Tasmania have cloud seeding programs, operational cloud seeding programs. And so this forecasting of precipitation and the clouds and the meteorology will support their cloud seeding programs too. So the diagram, diagrams on the bottom, we're looking at the orography of the Snowy Mountains here in Southeast Australia and then Tasmania. The, the color schemes are the same, the scales are slightly different, so be a little careful. Um, in the snowy, the elevations get up to 2,200 meters at Mount Kosciuszko. In Tasmania, the highest peak is just over 1,600 meters at Mount Osso. Um, one of the vast differences between these regions, so what we have here are a lot of dots talking about where we have surface precipitation measurements or indicating where we have surface precipitation measurements. And over the snowy, you can look through the region, and these are ones that are operated or maintained by the Bureau of Meteorology for their records. But snowy hydra themselves operate an independent network of observations at high elevation, so they can get a very good idea of how much precipitation is entering in their catchment systems. Counter to that, if you look over Tasmania and the high, high country in Tasmania, the high elevation, you'll find, especially along the west along this heritage wilderness area and along this area here have very very few observations so it's it's very sparsely populated i mean we have a vast difference in scales between what we have here in the snowy mountains and what we have over tasmania and uh, this is interesting to us because um we want to see what lessons we can learn over the snowy where we have very good observations apply over tasmania um, you know it's just a way of building confidence in some of the science going on and to get a, a broad feel of what we're looking at, here we have the average wintertime or wet season precipitation. So this is seven months, April through October. This is a two year average, 2014, 2015. This is the average wet season precipitation over Tasmania. And we have three vastly different representations there. And you could imagine if you had three vastly different representations, it would dramatically affect your hydrology models your estimates of how much water you might have available to generate hydroelectric power. Here on the left-hand image, we have what's called a, a reanalysis, a precipitation reanalysis. This is done from a, a global weather package where we take a look at our precipitation from satellites, from various ground observations. It's on a very coarse resolution. It's on a resolution of, I believe, 75 kilometers. And, and when you have such a coarse resolution, you basically wipe out most of the mountains. You can see an elevated precipitation over here along the western part of Tasmania, but overall the precipitation is quite light on average and it's, it's 3.9, less than four millimeters a day average precipitation. In the center here we have the precipitation analysis. This is based on the surface rainfall data, so this is from all these observations we see here across Tasmania, the, the daily precipitation would go into making a product 
for the precipitation across Tasmania. And this is on a five kilometer resolution, and this is what the Bureau of Meteorology supports. This is, is I'll be referring to this as the AWAP product, the Australian Water Availability uh, uh, Precipitation or Project. And this is a daily product produced, and, and we can sit there and get an estimate of how much precipitation is at different points. And again, you'll, you'll notice that along here where we have the heaviest precipitation, I'll just skip back, you'll see this is some of the areas where we have very, very few observations. So our confidence in the product there is relatively limited. This product here on the right-hand side comes from the Bureau of Meteorology. Again, this is their operational forecast. So this is using their numerical weather model. This is Access VT, so that's the Victoria and Tasmania Regional Simulation. It's, it's, it was run at 4K, four kilometer resolution. It's, it's recently been improved to 1.5 kilometer resolution. And you can sit there and see that it, it probably maps the orography a bit better. These, these faint lines here are giving us some orographic or elevation levels through Tasmania. You can see here along the north, we also have another peak up here that we see both in the reanalysis and in the numerical simulations. Overall, though, we see a fairly large difference between these two, 5.6 millimeters per day, 6.9, nearly 7 millimeters per day for the reanalysis, 20% less for the numerical simulations. And our goal, ultimately, is to improve these forecasts and to better understand any biases that may be coming into the observations here, this reanalysis product, to give us better, more reliable precipitation forecasts for the hydroelectric companies. One of the lessons we've learned from the Snowy, as, as I just mentioned previously, is that the Australian Water Availability Project, or precipitation, AWAP, has biases in the mountain areas. Um, here we are looking at the Snowy, so we're just zoomed in on the Snowy Mountains. Again, we have these little crosses where, in circles where Snowy Hydro have observations and then the Bureau has some observations. And what we're looking at here is the difference in precipitation. Now, this is taken for 10 months, May through September for two years, and then it's averaged, so it's cut in half. So it's a, the annual difference in precipitation between the AWEP product, which is our best guess of surface precipitation, and what the independent Snowy Hydro Network measured. And what you can see here is rather large differences, up to 500 millimeters per year, uh, per five months, the winter months, on the upwind side of the Snowy Mountains. Our highest elevations are over 1,400 meters in this shaded in area here, hatched in area there. And, and on the upwind side, we see we have the Snowy seeing much more precipitation than the precipitation analysis. And conversely, when we get downwind, we see that the reanalysis product or the precipitation analysis product is slightly overestimating precipitation. If you're in the Snowy Mountains and you are, you know, trying to operate as, as soundly as possible and directing stream flow down the Snowy versus the Murray versus the Murrumbidgee, having these accurate precipitation forecasts are essential. To put this in perspective, in one year, you might get 1,500, or one winter season, you might get 1,500 millimeters of precipitation near the peak. So a 500 millimeter estimate is going to be quite substantial. Some work we've done more recently, here we are looking not now at the reanalysis product, but looking at the Bureau's forecasting product. So this is going back to that Access VT model. And here we have the rainfall analysis from the snowy independent network. So we have the best field observations we have. We're looking at the precipitation. Now that this is now all of a sudden gone up in amount because we're now looking over at both years. We haven't divided it by two. This is the access simulations. So this is the 10 month accumulated amount. And, and we again can look at the difference between these and we can see some very, very strong differences, but it's, it's the opposite here. Here we see that the model is overestimating the field observations. The model is putting too much precipitation on these upwind slopes. 
these steep upwind slopes are very key, are, are an important key for us in getting to precipitation. So we, we expect the reanalysis product, the broad reanalysis product used through Australia to have biases. We see that the numerical simulations have biases in the opposite direction up here. And this is what we're trying to get at. So um, just stepping back for a moment and having a, a very, very shallow or, or not shallow, but having a very simple uh, discussion on orographic precipitation, it's, it's really fairly straightforward, the basic concept. When you take moist air upwind of the mountains and you force it up over the mountains, as the air rises, the pressure drops. As the pressure drops, the air expands. As it expands, it cools. So as the air cools, it's going to be reaching saturation. You have a certain amount of moisture, you cool it down, the water is going to condense and you'll get your precipitation. So we know that throughout the world, if we have moisture upwind of mountains and we have air blowing over, we're going to get precipitation on the upwind slopes. This has been known for centuries, if not much, much longer. Conversely, on the downwind side, when we've sat there and taken all the precipitation out of these clouds or removed a lot of precipitation. The air comes down the other side. The air gets, comes lower in elevation. The pressure increases, it warms. And actually this air down here is often warmer than the upwind air just because we've removed all of this energy, or I'm sorry, we've added this latent heating through here when we've formed the precipitation and removed the water. These are often dry downslope winds. So that, that's the classic picture of orographic precipitation. And that's what you would want to make sure the models are doing correctly. The more real, the more recent, uh, the, you know, the, the academic view is actually, it's much more complex than that. We can have a number of different processes going on, dynamics and microphysics that, uh, you know, tell us how the mountains, the orography can change the precipitation. So whereas we had the one classic picture before, there are at least a dozen different documented ways in which mountains or orography can affect clouds and precipitation. And we would really like to get a handle on this over the snowy mountains. We want to get a much better idea of what's going on, make sure we get the models right, get the forecasts right, get the observations better too. One of the things we've come to appreciate over the past decade some new satellites came up 10, 15, 20 years ago, and we've come to appreciate that our clouds and, and our precipitation in the southern hemisphere, over the southern part of Tas uh, the Great Dividing Range, the lower Great Dividing Range over Tasmania, is much different than in the northern hemisphere. What we're looking at here is a climatology of the frequency that we would be seeing liquid clouds composed of supercooled liquid water. So these are clouds of liquid drops, not ice. The temperature drops below freezing, so we force them up over the mountains. And what we know is that, you know, normally when you drop below freezing, you expect the clouds to glaciate, to, to freeze up, to get ice. It's not very efficient here. We, we don't have the ice nuclei. So during the winter season, we commonly see, this was taken by a satellite instrument, MODIS, that 30, 40% of the time over Tasmania, we can be getting these super cool liquid water clouds present along the western part of Tasmania and along the upwind slopes of the Great Dividing Range. By comparison, these are some areas in the western United States, classically, where they do cloud seeding. And you'll see the frequency of getting these super cool liquid water clouds are 10%, 15%, 20%. And when we have an appreciation of why this is happening, part of this is to do with altitude, with how cold the air gets, but another very important factor has to do with the pollution between the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere and the amount of land and, and biogenic activity. In the Northern Hemisphere, there's more land, there's more pollution, there's more ice nuclei. They, these are important for actually converting the supercooled liquid water to ice. Down in the Southern Hemisphere, sorry, in the southern hemisphere, we don't have nearly as much of these, or nearly as many of these ice nuclei compared to what we see in the northern hemisphere. We have much more supercooled liquid water. This is very inefficient at precipitating, which is why cloud seeding can be effective in these regions. Just looking at some relative differences, we've 
in the past produced a climatology for snowy hydro for some of the different stakeholders that are interested in looking at how the seasonality of these clouds change. And here we were looking through a 10 year period for the frequency of clouds and the frequency of supercooled liquid water clouds and liquid water clouds. And then the winter of 2006, a bit like this past winter, was a disaster winter for dryness. Um, I imagine some of you can remember back to that, but it was a very dry year here in Melbourne. Um, it's really what large uh, helped us commit to a desalinization plant or scared us into building a desalinization plant. Um, it was a very, very dry year towards the end of the millennial drought. And what we see is a large reduction in clouds. We see a very, very large reduction of these super cold liquid water clouds, but even the liquid water clouds. We know there was a strong reduction in these precipitating clouds during that winter. So that kind of takes us to where we are in this research project we have, which was just approved and we need to get it up and running. We'll be out there next winter. But the, the key summary statement is, this research will identify how the complex mountain terrain across the Snowy Mountains in Tasmania alters key dynamical and microphysical mechanisms that produce wintertime precipitation. New dedicated field observations will be supplemented with newly available satellite-based cloud and precipitation products to identify where and how precipitation is enhanced and redistributed by the mountains of Southeast Australia. So we want to improve the numerical simulations. The field observations will be used to assess the skill of the high resolution numerical simulations. We want to evaluate the Bureau of Meteorology's forecasts. We want to improve these forecasts. We want to improve quantitative precipitation estimates, observations, and forecasts against these new observations. And then we want to test the sensitivity of these simulations to key dynamical and microphysical processes. We want to understand how it's working, what mechanisms are important for precipitation over the Snowy Mountains and over Tasmania. And then we'll be looking at the synoptic meteorology, and we will be sitting there and taking a look at how this may be changing in a changing climate. And as a specific point of interest is, is the interaction between precipitation and orography. We'll be looking at the flood from last June in Tasmania, the once in a 80 year flood that was rather tragic. We're gonna be making a case study of this to understand the, the interaction between precipitation and orography. And just briefly, to take a look at some of the new technologies, new satellite observations. A little over a year ago, or a couple of years ago, the Bureau of Meteorology started employing a new satellite, Himawari 8. It's, it's a, you know, a dramatic improvement from what we had before. Much, much higher resolution, spatially and temporally. 10 minute resolution, one to two kilometer spatial resolution. This is what you would see off the Bureau of Meteorology's website. What you don't see is a whole bunch of different things that the satellite does that we can use for helping us improve numerical models. We can get the cloud top pressure, we can get the cloud top temperature, we can get the thermodynamic phase, whether it's ice or whether it's liquid. So we could say whether it's ice or mixed phase or super cool liquid water or warm liquid we can get the effective radius during the daytime. So during the daytime, we can sit there and say just how fat are the droplets or how tiny are the droplets and how likely are they to precipitate. Overnight, we don't get to see that. This is another satellite in instrument that we've been using for a long time, MODIS, and this is also giving us liquid water path, another way to evaluate the forecasts. Just some very, very recent simulations from one of our PhD students. Uh, working with snowy hydro. So this is up over the snowy mountains and we're trying to evaluate some numerical simulations and, and this is how we compare some of the new satellite observations against the precipitation, against the numerical simulations. Here we're looking at clouds. We also have precipitation. But you can sit there and, sorry, this is actually remarkably good. I know you can't appreciate that, but you know, we are very excited to see these results at how well we can get the simulations against the really very, very fine scale observations nowadays. This is another satellite, GPM. This is a, another radar that's out in space. 
And this is a radar that can measure precipitation rates. So this is looking at precipitation. This is the satellite track coming down through here. And the radar is measuring across. And we're getting precipitation rates along the lower Great Dividing Range. So here we are along Australia. Here's Melbourne. And then we can zoom in over the snowy mountains. And we can actually use that radar to reconstruct cloud heights and cloud shapes. And then we can use the models and reconstruct this too to see how the dynamics are doing and how the microphysics are doing. And so again, one of the goals is to go back to our numerical simulations once we've evaluated them, once we have confidence in them, is to go back and look at how that converts to precipitation on the ground, but also then to go back and look at the actual dynamics and the microphysics that's going on and how that's producing precipitation. Then we hopefully turn over better products to Snowy Hydro, to Hydro Tasmania. Hopefully then they can sit there and develop precipitation, or sorry, develop power more efficiently, or produce power more efficiently, and then also have more confidence when releasing water for broader you know, community needs. Now that's pretty much my talk for today, Trevor. Yeah, I'm happy to answer questions. That, that is absolutely brilliant. It's an outstanding presentation, as I just said on the, on the chat line today. Thanks a lot, Stephen. There's an enormous amount of data goes into that. The Himawari and MODIS uh, data coming down. Is a big, talk about big data. That's going to keep you busy for a long, long time, I'd yeah. say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's so exciting for us to see some of these yeah. products come online. So much more we can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, hit the Q&A button and let's have those questions rolling in. I've got a couple of questions here, but I'll start off first of all with Cameron. I don't think he's coming on screen, but he'll ask a, ask a question. Right over to you, Cameron. Look, thanks very much, uh, Steve. Very interesting presentation. I was particularly uh, interested to hear uh, you mention about the flooding in Tasmania in June 2016, because in the lead up to that period, there was a, a very long dry spell in Tasmania, I think from around September 2015 to April 2016. And during that time, the, uh, the interconnector, the, the cable between Tasmania and the mainland of some 290 kilometres, I believe, was, uh, had suffered a, uh, a problem. And so Tasmania wasn't able to be connected to the national energy grid. Um, so for Tasmania, they weren't able to uh, to either export their hydropower or indeed to access uh, power from the mainland, and that coincided with that uh, with that very dry spell. Uh, did that have much of an impact on Hydro Tasmania in their uh, you know their current interest in uh, you know improving their uh, access to to good data? Um, certainly, I, I mean. Uh, yes, I, I have very strong collaborative links with Hydro Tasmania, and, and we've already started looking in that flooding event. Um, there was an inquiry down in, in Tasmania regarding the management and the response to the flooding event. But you're absolutely right. The uh, summer before had been an extremely dry period, and the reservoirs were extremely low, and then the, the link, Bass Link, went down earlier. And it was, it was all shaping up to be quite a catastrophic situation, or maybe that's getting a little bit too dramatic, but um, Hydro Tasmania had brought in diesel generators and they were starting to you know, generate energy through diesel power, just as trying to minimize or, or trying to supplement what little energy they had. Um, so, you know, I mean, those events you can't really change in life. And, and, and our forecasts, you know, I mean, in time, we would love to be able to do, to, to work with the Bureau and move to, you know, three months and six months forecasts of precipitation. But um, th those are still beyond our, the scope of this project and, and beyond our immediate research interests. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Uh, you're correct. Hydro Tasmania was dramatically affected by both the, uh, the damage to BassLink and by, this, uh, by the dry period beforehand. Yep. Th thanks. Uh, thanks, Cameron. And thanks. Uh, is that is that uh, sufficient, Cameron? Does that get to the nub of the problem for you? Uh, yes. Yeah. I just had a uh, a little look at Hydro Tasmania's website there, and they've got some uh, you know some good history on on that uh, on that episode. But uh, yeah, it's uh, really interesting to see the connection between you know climate and uh, an energy uh, yes. a water and energy nexus there. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. That's a great question. And that's the issue here for Ice Warm wants to get a hold of how water and energy do uh, interact together and the, the rainfall aspects of it, precipitation um, uh, and the uh, energy that that's the other question here <coughs> that I've got in front, of me, in front of me right now. Is there good capacity in TAS hydropower, in, in the hydropower coming out of Tasmania, to offset the anticipated serious drop in energy? Uh, as Eastern States coal, you can see where I'm going with coal-fired generators sure. closed down. I don't want to be uh, politically um, correct here, and it's not quite in the science what you're, that you're talking about, but I think this is what your science is going to get to eventually. Am I right? Well, uh, certainly. I, I mean, this is all part of the calculation, the consideration for Hydro Tasmania. Just like Snowy Hydro, they're very interested in supplementing and building their, their pump hydro capabilities, their, their power, their ability to generate power during peak times to use Bastling. Um, I know Snowy Hydro has gotten a lot of the attention, but the Prime Minister was in Tasmania too, and, and I, I know it's become a, a priority for Hydro Tasmania to increase their <coughs> pump hydro capabilities. There's, there's a whole lot more we could say here. Um, I, I'm uh, stunned with the amount of graphics in your presentation and the uh, clar clarity that brings to this whole issue. Um, we, we haven't got uh, questions coming in at the moment, so I Oh, we don't need to be we're drawing this out. It's been a terrific presentation. And because it's going up on the web as a, re, uh, a recorded um, uh, webinar, uh, we uh, expect there'll be a lot of people, particularly in the uh, uh, mountains around the northern part of India and Nepal. We've had already questions uh, from our counterparts up there as to how they can, particularly Nepal, how they can use their hydropower more effectively uh, in that region. So we are highly appreciative of this um, of this presentation, Steve. Uh, and I'd like to let everybody know that if okay with you, Steve, we can PDF this into a secure PDF and put uh, set, send it out to our um, attendees today. Is that are you sure. okay with that? Please go ahead. All right, yeah. that's that's really really much appreciated. So um, we'll call it a close there. Um, but before we finish, I just wanted to let you know there's a feedback form coming up as you close the window. Be sure to um, tick. Uh, the questions there and make any comments you wish to. That'll help us shape the future webinars. Uh, our recording will also be mailed to you along with that PDF, as I said earlier. Uh, and um, be sure to look out for these um, the webinars coming up. There's three of them there listed there. They're free webinars. We'd love to have you join us uh, and to keep up to date with Icewarm, join us on our Twitter, Twitter line. But for today, that's great. Thank you for joining us, everybody. And thank you so much, Steve, for your excellent presentation. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Steve. Well, thank you, Trevor. Thank Bye. you.